ಮಾಮಲವು ಮಾಮಲವು introduction i am carlos's favorite you can add whatever else you like after that yeah. my name is mihana okala hind i come from the island of oahu and you can tell all us oahu people here today cuz we are wearing shoes that not meant for be walking in waipa today yeah carlos kaihu wa anjari We will hear many a story today about this man. We will rejoice in those memories that we share with the speakers that come up. We will also reflect on those memories that nobody else knows about except us. I have a few of those that I cherish very dearly. Yeah. Uh, we are going to have the spread of speakers that cross his life span um come up here today and the first one that we'd like to bring forward to all of you is from the ohana of course and that's his brother pierre andrade on a call up welcome to all of you it's very nice to see this large crowd it's as large as i expected knowing what carlos was like during his life Um the speakers today were given 8 minutes to tell their story and Pilika my dear niece Carlos's daughter decided to start that out by having a Portuguese speak first I don't know she's dreaming eh? eight minutes <laughs> So I am to tell you about my early memories of Carlos and our family And I think I'll start with something I learned about my mother just yesterday. When she was pregnant with Carlos, Carlos was born in Kilauea. When she was pregnant with Carlos and he was insisting on getting out, she had to walk to the clinic because they had no wheels for transportation. The rest of us got born in Wilcox. So we went by wheels but she walked for Carlos. When I was born, I'm number 3. No, yes, I'm number 3. Those high numbers, you know, it's kind of hard to keep track. Carlos was one, Russell was two, I'm number 3. Brother Paul in back side of the tent there is number 4. My sister Susan is number 5. And my dad always wanted to have a girl. So when he had a girl, he said, you know, that was it. They're stopping. But fortunately, 
that was not something they could control. And <clears throat> number six was the gift from heaven when Kimo was born. My brother Kimo. That was his wife who just said that. <laughs> so I can only tell you a few anecdotes about my life and our family's life because I spent a great deal of my life away from the family, as did Carlos actually. Um, when he was in the, actually I want to tell you something when, when he was even younger. When I was two years old, we were living in Waipoli. Carlos was five, or five and a half at that point. And my mother used to allow Carlos to take Russell and myself out to Baby Beach, which was a walk of, uh, I don't know, a quarter to half a mile or so, and spend the day swimming at Baby Beach and bringing us back with no adult supervision. And this was how Carlos started life, being responsible very early in his life. And those kinds of responsibilities, because he was the oldest, landed on his shoulders time after time during our lives. When he was in the sixth grade, he got accepted to Komemea School, another priceless gift. And so off he went and left the family. So at the time when I was becoming a sentient being, and beginning to understand that I was human, and I had relatives, <laughs> siblings, uh, he disappeared out of our life. But then when I was in the sixth grade, I got accepted to Kamehameha as well. And my father decided that he was going to have Carlos train me up. So we were a family of eight, including the two adults, six children, living in a two bedroom home. But our garage had a room at the back, which was suitable for a couple of people to live in. And we named things, you know, in those days, and we had really kind of fancy names for things. Well, we named this room the back room. <laughs> Very original, I know. And Carlos and I lived in that room for the summer, and he taught me how to f make a military bed, as Kamehameha School was a military school at the time, and we wore uniforms every day to school. How to make a bed, how to fold my clothes, how to press iron shirts and trousers and the like. And so off I went to Kamehameha School. And you would think that I would then have lots of intimate um, association with Carlos during those years, but he was an upperclassman. I was a, um, in the elementary school, lived in separate dorms, so I rarely saw him, but I would see him at times. And then as I got into high school, he was finishing and he left to the mainland. So again, a dissociation in my association with Carlos. But he would come home at summers and uh, he told us the most fantastic tales. And this, during this time, of course, Carlos is becoming this enormous figure in my life, as big as my father was. My father was a giant when I was a child. When he was older, he was not really big, but when I was a kid, he was a giant. And so was Carlos. He had this aura about him. And he came back from the mainland, and I remember a couple of tales he told us. He said, you know, in the mainland they have these things called freeways. And our eyes got big freeways, wow, sad. <laughs> well, these are big roads, if you get on a road, and you don't take the right time to get off the road, you gotta go for miles and miles and miles, and then you get off the road, and then you're lost. Then you have to come back on the freeway to find where you got lost from. Wow, freeways, man. That's cool, huh? And he said, you know, and everybody in the mainland has a new car. There's no jalopies like we have here in Kauai. Everybody has a new car. Oh, wow. So his stature got even bigger, right? So anyway, I finally graduated from camp school and I went off to college. And during my college years, kind of a seminal, the Vietnam War was on full force. Any Vietnam veterans here? Raise your hands. Come on, don't be shame. Yeah, there's a bunch. You know, it's Veterans Day. There's a pretty much. So Russell and Paul went to Vietnam, and Carlos got, and Paul was on, no, Russell was on a battleship, 
Paul was on a riverboat on the Mekong Delta. Um, Carlos, true to his nature, had decided very early in his life he was never going to do anything that would result in harm to anyone. He was not about to use a weapon to injure anyone. And so he was advised by a friend, listen, if you don't want to do this, just tell them that you will not use a rifle, which he did. And they subsequently ejected him from the service. And my father apparently was less than happy. But later on in my father's life, he was justifiably proud of Paul and Russell, as you can imagine. And he was just as proud of his son that refused to go. So that rift was healed, but it was a big issue at the time. So, <clears throat> but to fast forward a little bit, because during my professional life, um, I was at one point stationed in Italy and then several places in, in the continental US, and then eventually wound up back in Washington State. And uh, <clears throat> before we had gone to Italy, I had gotten a little small piece of vacation property on a lake. And when we came back, I put up a shell on this property, a cabin shell. So four walls and a roof <clears throat> and a deck, but nothing interior other than the plumbing and the raw electric. And I was, you know, I knew about Carlos's music and his life as a musician and that he was making songs. And he sent me an album on tape. And this was his first album, and I had it in a little cassette tape, which I took up to the um, to the house, and I was working in the house building bunks on the on the loft, and I was playing this tape, and it was the Pacific Tunings tape, and I played the tape through, and I flipped it over, and went back to work, played it through, flipped it over, etc. All day long, I worked in that room for eight hours. And when I left that room, and I was on my way home, suddenly it came upon me a sensation like I had been visiting Carlos at his home and talking story with him all day long. I had this joy and contentment in me as I drove home because I had visited with my brother all day. Later on, um, once again, fast forward. I know I'm approaching my eight minute mark, so I'm gonna go back. <laughs> when Carlos was sick, I had the privilege of being able to advise him about his illness and advise him about what his lab was trying to tell him and advise him about his medications. So I was so honored to be able to talk to him about these things. I talked to him very frequently and at times as often as every day or even more than once a day. I think it was during that time that I became the friend to Carlos that I had always wanted to be. Um, and in a perverse sort of way, it took his illness to make me his really, really good friend. So after he died, I, I wanted to say one more thing about his music, because his music has been so important to so many of us and all of you. My two brothers and I, uh, Paul and Kimo, were in my truck towing a big trailer full of race motorcycles, and we were heading down to California to go to a vintage motorcycle race. And we were listening to music off my iPad, and all of a sudden, comes out of the speakers, away, and it was Carlos singing a song. And I wish I could tell you the title of the song, but if you look on Pacific Tunings, you'll find it. And the song is about his lament of Hawaii and the direction that Hawaii was traveling in and his difficulty with that. <clears throat> but to the three of us, 
the Awe was really a lament about his illness, right? It struck us. It struck us like a thunderbolt, and we were totally silent. We were driving along in this truck with road noise and engine noise and wind noise, and yet the silence was what we heard other than his voice. And he's finished this song, and the three of us really couldn't speak for a little bit. But it's just a moment in time that is so meaningful because of his music, and his music is so meaningful to so many of you and to us as well. So when I would speak to Carlos on the phone during that time, he'd always end with Aloha Pia. And I was, you know, this is Carlos. He's more Hawaiian than the rest of us, Portuguese Hawaiians. And you know, when I lived in Italy, I always said ciao, and ciao bella, buongiorno, and I, it was so cool. I said all those Italian words too. Well, here's Carlos being his Hawaiian self. Didn't give it much thought other than it was very gentle and nice to hear. And after he died, I had been reflecting on those conversations and I began to realize, relatedly, that Carlos wasn't just saying goodbye to me. He was saying, I love you, Pia. So, Allah Carlos. Uncle Pierre speaking and of course Hali'i dancing on behalf of the Ohana. In a family full of Portuguese, they elected one Portuguese for come and talk for all of them. Because they knew they wanted to make this one, one, you know, one reasonably timed ceremony. So mahalo Uncle Pierre and Hali'i. Next we're going to bring up his surfing Ohana. Yeah, and as they make their way to the stage, oh, they're here, Uncle Brian Tuzan and Rick Marvin. You know, one of the stories I like to tell about Carlos, and I asked Auntie Miley about this this morning. 
I said, when Carlos was at Kamakakokala and he had a picture in his office that faced the door. So it was on his desk facing the door and it was an eight by 10 picture of him surfing in his Speedos. Now, if you guys know Carlos Andrade, right, let's give a round of applause for that, first of all. And in his office, he also had his surfboard. He had his big 19-foot surfboard, and he had that picture facing the door. So I said, Auntie Miley, where's the picture? The one with the model on, or the Speedo, which one was it? She goes, oh, it was the Speedo one. I go, where's that picture? I don't see him up on the thing. She goes, oh, no, we couldn't find it anywhere. I was like, no lie, you guys are never gonna burn that picture. She goes, no, he put it by the door so people wouldn't come in the office. I said, I don't know, he was a hero at Kamakakuo Kalani for that picture, you know. But then that's how we all knew he was Poragi. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys get the joke, you guys get the joke. If you guys don't, you guys gotta go look some more Portuguese. Get plenty over here. Just look around. Now we'd like to bring from his surfing Ohana for Uncle Brian Tuzan and Rick Martin. Yes, um, you know, Carlos had many, many surfing friends. So the, the part that I'm gonna talk on is the West Side, his West Side connection uh, of, of surfing because uh, there's many giants on the North Shore that can, that can talk about Carlos and, and his surfing escapades and on Oahu. But, um, well, uh, Carlos, Carlos opened up, as far as I can, as legend, as the legend goes, I think Carlos and some friends, Randy Weir was one of them, opened up Pakala to the rest of the surfing world. Randy Weir's grandfather is a Robinson. His house sits right there where everybody could see if, if they surf Pakala. And Carlos, when he was on his, when he was in school on Oahu, I guess he met Randy and they were surfing, and Carlos was raving about the surf break, and Randy told him, bah, you never see the surf break in front of my grandfather's house. And so the summer, I remember it as 63. Others might remember it differently, but in 63, Carlos uh, and a few of the, few of the friends were the first guys, man. Outside of the, outside of the Pakala kids, if they were ever surfing there, they were the first guys to surf Bacala, and then the rest, the rest is history. And so, for all of us now, and for all of you guys that uh, surf Bacala, uh, we owe it to Carlos. So, when you come to Bacala, respect Bacala, and, re and, and that way you'll be respecting, you'll be respecting Carlos. But in, in his early years, in his early years, I, I was still very young, and I didn't have a surfboard of my own, so I was always chasing after somebody with a surfboard. And, um, but another guy, I, another surfer that he really admired uh, and respected was uh, this guy named Liko Ho'okano. And so I'm gonna invite Liko to come up and, and share uh, some thoughts about Carlos. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everybody. Hey. So my brother Brian asked me the other day if I would speak in behalf of Carlos and uh, his connection to the West Side. So I kind of wrote some thoughts down because I kind of all my own. So I wrote some thoughts that I'd like to share with share with you. So I need my maka anyway. So brother Carlos, uh, his connection to the West Side involved many many friends who, like himself, had a passion for surfing. But you know what, uh, another important link to the West Side, that this is important for you to know, is his love for Olela Hawaii and for the Hawaiian speaking community and Mele. And this, I'm referring particular to the Ni'ihau uh, Ohana. He had a very close ties with them as far as the language and the early Mele's. And as uh, Brother Brian said, he was the earliest to pioneer for what was and has become a very popular surf break. I cannot mention names, but particularly it was for retired folks like us, and not so much for the whippersnappers. So it's really for us guys, 
Uh, Brother Carlos was highly respected as a regular in the lineup there at Pakala. I said I was to go mention that. But in fact, uh, regarded as a legend uh, for us in the surfing community. And we certainly miss his presence uh, this summer. Carlos is especially dear to a dear cousin of mine, uh, Khalil Ho'okano, and myself. Uh, often did sleepovers during the summer months when the waves were uh, breaking. However, during the winter swells, he would, we would come and surf with Carlos, and we would find ourselves in the Lo'i up in the uh, Hanali Valley and uh, all lean to, and we would surf with him here. And, and a long story short, uh, while we were up with all the mosquitoes in the valley, <laughs> Um, Carlos, Carlos would say, um, guess what, I, I, I saw a rainbow over Hanalei Bay. And so me and my cousin Khalil looked together and we said, yeah, you know, Hanalei is beautiful, has a beautiful rainbow. And then he said, when the ua, or when the rain came down, and we was wondering where he was going with this, he said, it trans all my pilikia, all my troubles away. And that's the song, uh, Hanalei Bay Blues. And so there was a lot of songs, you've already noticed that uh, he was singing to us in those days that never got recorded until very recently. There were other slacky tunes that he played for us, and, and some in particular I need to mention was for his grandchildren. He uh, played a lot of uh, slacky for his grandchildren that he, uh, he wrote. And I'll tell Carlos, Carlos, you should get this in writing. Put it in guitar tabs or in form of, of music. And, I, and I'm not sure if he did that. So a lot of the songs that he played in the old days that we, we hear today on the radio. And by the way, Carlos was my kumu for uh, Kiuhan because he taught me, he introduced me to Selecki. And that's what we would do uh, in the evenings when he would frequent the west side during the summer months. And so Carlos was very timely in arriving at my house, usually at dinner time. <laughs> and so we would, we would play Slacky during the evening. And, uh, and it's so sad, this summer was the first summer that uh, we had Carlos' absence in the lineup in, in our surf spot. But uh, I, I'm hoping I can feel his spot there. But anyway, I, I promised I'd be brief. Um, I'd like to say ma mahalo to Carlos uh, Ohano, Ohana for allowing me to share some brief thoughts. Please accept uh, my aloha because I, I know the emptiness that comes when we you know, lose someone that's so dear, dear to us. And please know that Carlos will be missed, but, but not forgotten. Aloha, thank you folks. One thing about Carlos, uh, in the early days, man, that, that guy, he had one of the smoothest drop knees. Uh, for, those, for those of us that are old timers and know what a drop knee is, he had one of the smoothest drop knees you, you could ever watch, uh, especially at Pakala, because Pakala is a wave that at the end of the wave, it just sets it all up for the drop knee. And Carlos, Carlos understood that. And, and there's pictures uh, on, 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 the, on the board there of him riding on the nose. That's part of him setting up. That's about the middle of the wave. He's riding on the nose. And just as he gets, before he gets to the end, he's gonna stretch out his legs, he's gonna get down, and he's gonna pull up his shots. <laughs> yeah! Or, or as um, his sister said, he would, he, would, he would pull up the Hawaiian tuxedo. <laughs> and Abayo would just lay into an, into an drop knee cutback that was so smooth and so roundhouse. And it was just beautiful to watch, man. The guy, the guy is just beautiful to watch. Whether he's playing music, whether he's surfing, even when he's lecturing you. <laughs> and Pierre, Pierre said, uh, he, he made it a point, he, did not, he was not going to do anything to uh, pick up any firearm that was going to hurt his fellow man. But Carlos knew how to put you in your place with his lips. 
Yes, I'm not gonna have the vocabulary there. Um, one other thing, one other thing that brought Carlos to the West Side every summer was the mangoes. Every summer he would he, he had trees that he would ask about. What about over here? What about over there? Still get no more. Oh, but he he knew. He knew where Liquor Boy's house was around dinner time, and then he knew where the mango trees were. So, yeah, he's he, he not going to stop. He's not going to stop. Another thing that Carlos was noted for was for his recycling. Before recycling became even a fad or a thing to do like today, brother was recycling already. He used to tear down, one of the things he was well known for was tearing down old houses. And some of these older plantation homes, um, they had the they had the real full dimension lumber. One by twelve was one by twelve. Two by four was two by four. You know, and all of those things. And those those uh, lumber were well preserved because as the ships, uh, like in Waimea, for instance, we had we had a we get the landing it used to be further out. The ships would come into Waimea, and they would dump the lumber out in the ocean, and they would kind of gather the lumber towards the shoreline and then pick them up. In the meantime, that lumber is soaking up all the salt water and it became a natural preservative against termites. And Carlos understood that. And so when he started tearing down old buildings, he, he, he went after that lumber. And he and I um, took apart a house uh, in Kamakani. Uh, he, he, he took the rafters, the, the roof, part and I took what, what was down below and that stuff was hauled all the way to P Pila along with some of the other stuff that he was gathering and he built his first house in Pila with recycled lumber nice. you know and I went I went one day to help him I think the the, the, the floor system was up and we were just gonna put the floor on the, the. and so I, I got there and you know after he Hello, hello, talk story, how's the waves, this and that. He told me, oh, get, one, get, get the, the nails there underneath over there with a post. So, I, oh, okay. I, I go over I see one coffee can full with nails, but all bent the nails. <laughs> Gotta strain them up yet before we can. Brother was on recycling. <laughs> he was on recycling. And, ironically, ironically, he built his first house in Pila, and he built his last house in Pila. And here to talk about his last house and, and all of that is his friend Rick, who helped build that last house with him. Aloha, everybody. Um, this is the greatest honor of my life to stand in front of my family and Carlos's family and all your families and this community and share um, some of the stories and the great times that I got to spend with Carlos. It was truly a blessing in my life. When uh, in 1975, Carlos and Miley got to Pila and um, he came down. I had a little shack already going on the beach and he came down to pick Lima Coal and um, stopped by on his way out to check us out. And I had a little 12 by 16 shack and we had a gas stove, gas refrigerator, wood burning water heater, um, a, a gallon or a, a dollar of kerosene would give you reading light for a month. And it was a great time. And Carlos saw what we had going there and was inspired. And then uh, got on to getting, taking down houses and building them. And, uh, he invited me to go with him and tear down a house at Neil Muller. Well, we went down there to take the lumber. It was full size, like Brian was saying. It was beautiful stuff. And we loaded it up on our truck to take home. And these weren't pieces of lumber. Carlos called this stuff. These were choice slabs. And that's how he was. He was the um, salt of the earth. He was the greatest guy. He was very loving but he could be gruff and rustic too, and uh, a man's man, Carlos was. We got to uh, build that house, and then um, the lumber from the first house that he built at Pila'a, we ended up tearing down about two years ago, 
and moving it to the Ulu house that they call where Russell used to live. Now, um, Russell and I go way back. Russell built the, or dug the hole for the septic system, or not septic, but a cesspool at my house back then. And um, Carlos was stoked that we had flush toilet, we had hot shower, everything was, was stuff that he wanted to be able to do, and he did. We spent um, years together and then kind of drifted apart. We didn't see each other for a long time because I was busy with my life and he was busy with his. But we got a call from a guy named Barlow Chu and invited the two of us to come for lunch at his place. Barlow was a policeman on the island way back and he invited us there just to kind of share his, his uh, cookhouse. He had the most beautiful uh, cookhouse there in, uh, Kapa uh, in uh, Kapahi. And we went up there and as you get to the place, you have the mountain, Kalvaikini is totally clear. And um, we go into the cookhouse and he's got his little paddock down below with his sheep and he's cooking lamb on the wood burning um, stove there. He's got his little tea kettle and this, this place was a recycler's dream. He had everything he needed in there and it was like a work of art, complete work of art that he had created in his little cookhouse. And we really appreciated being able to go there and spend that time with him. Both of us um, really loved that recycled and, and uh, that look. It was, it was great. Later on, um, we'd have Thanksgiving down at our place at Pila'a. And uh, Carlos and Russell were always invited. It was a special time down there because we'd do an emu. And we'd cook uh, turkeys and pork butts and you know, callow from the yard and sweet potatoes. And it was just a special time with all our families and friends that lived in the area. Uh, Carlos would come down and, and Russell would come. Russell would come in his cowboy boots and his ukulele and Carlos would show, Carlos would show up in his BVDs. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> he was comfortable, he was casual. Those were, as Palika told me later on, that was Carlos's cotton shorts. <laughs> One year he came in his boxers, and the next year he came in his jockeys. He was, he was casual. Carlos had style, he had soul. He had so much soul. You could see it in um, things that he did around this island, like taking people up and down the coast early on with Clancy on the Zodiac, um, surfing all over the island. Um, he had his little canoe concession at the seashell by the uh, Coco Palms. Started out you know, way back at uh, uh, Coco Palms. Then he was at uh, Hanalei, he had his canoe. Um, we got together working with boats and had a, a great time. Um, a story that he shared with me was once he and uh, Joy Cabell were out sailing on Joy's Hokulea and the kids were with him, uh, uh, was uh, uh, Kai Molino and Trevor, and they were down in the little cabin, tiny little cabin there, and Carlos said they were riding giant ocean, open ocean swells with smoke and trades. And uh, what an experience that must have been for them. I wish I could have been there for that one. Um, later on, in the last two years of Carlos's life, we worked together a lot, because I had, uh, was blessed enough to be able to retire, and I had time to uh, share with Carlos. And we built things, we uh, uh, did a lot of demo, that was kind of our forte, we were really good at demo. And uh, reconstructing things, and it was just uh, one of the greatest pleasures of my life to spend those two years with Carlos and, uh, and clean it up and make it nice. And uh, he was the ultimate recycler until the last two weeks of his life, he was out there stripping boards, taking nails out of boards. And I, I think his kids, if they look, inside any of the sheds or the containers down there, they're gonna find uh, five gallon buckets full of nails that have been bent back into shape, ready, for, ready to be used again. So I wanna thank um, Mark and Priscilla, have been great neighbors to Carlos and I, and um, we appreciate that. Um, we also wanna thank um, Terry Tico, who was um, real important to us in some troubled times down there, and challenges that we experienced in Terry we're so glad she was on our side. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you so much. I want to thank my wife for putting up with me and sticking with me. And um, I want to thank uh, a guy named Mud Warner, 
who turned my brother and I, Nick, on to uh, Kauai and, and gave us kind of a, a, a spirit and a lift and, and something that made us feel at home here. My mom and dad for buying the property there and giving us a, a leg up. And another friend, um, he may be here today, I'm not sure, but um, a guy from Puuvai on Niihau once told me that when I took him out for his, uh, he and his wife's honeymoon, they, they were out on a sailing trip with me, as we came back to the island, he said something, he said, you should always say this when you return to land. He goes, mahalo nui loa, ke ao kua pū, a hui ho, ma lama puna, aloha. And uh, thank you all very much. It was a pleasure to know Carlos, and thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Mahalo nui loa, Uncle Brian, Uncle Kaliko, Uncle Rick, for that. That's going to be the second challenge of the day. Are there any of you surface today for go ride on wave, either in one cotton shorts or one speedos? And when you get them, take a picture of them, post them online, tag me. Yeah. Then you win the challenge. They're going to have one of these guys where Papali give them to you. <laughs> As the band is setting up to, to honor this, this surfing nature of Carlos, I also wanted, if you guys were wondering, where is Carlos today? He's in that recycled part right there on that table. That was a recycled part that I believe Caimalino crafted out of their hale. Yeah, there's a part of the hale that was taken down, and that's where Carlos is. How appropriate. Um, is that, right? Peeling to that mana'o of Carlos being a recycler. I was driving down here with two of my, my hoa, my hoa papa from Kamakakua Kalani. And Dr. Kikiloi was in the car with us and he was sharing stories of Carlos and he said, you know, Carlos really is the creator of the discipline of Malama'aina. As far as an academic scholarly discipline. Carlos Andrade wrote a bunch of courses that now we have Dr. Beamer, Dr. Kiki Loy, Dr. Punivai, right? along with his colleagues there, Dr. Kome'ele Hiva, Dr. Osorio, Dr. Young, Dr. Trask um, there. But he really is, and really was, I'm gonna say is, that scholar that put together, that had to think through how this all was going to work out, right, to teach the next generation. Well, aloha aina and malama aina. So we mahalo him for that. Um, there. Yeah, pa'i pa'i nima for that. You know, I always give this, I'm going to tell another surfing story since, are you, are you guys my They tune in a little bit. Musicians, you can re always rely on them tuning. Yeah. So another story that Dr. Kikiloi told me was that he was, you know, we get together as students, somebody's house by the university, and we all hang out, drink ava, or drink whatever is there, talk story like that. Well, one night in our friend's house, there was um, surfers, like the kind, internationally known surfers. I'm not a surfer, so I don't remember the name. But his mo'olelo ended with, and if it were not for Carlos Andrade, I would not be the surfer that I am today. And to Dr. Kikilo and to me too, you know, we was just like, like shocked when I heard the story from him. I was like, oh yeah, Carlos has such a impact on the next generation. Not only creating a discipline that the next generation now is, is feeding, and is now teaching everyone. But we have these people who are internationally known surfers out there who, when they look back to their beginnings, they, car they credit Kauai's own Carlos Andrade for that. So mahalo, Carlos, and mahalo for those waves and all those kanaka that spent time with him on those waves. And speaking of waves, if you know anything about music over the last 40 years, you would recognize this gentleman that is up here with his iconic, iconic song, 
right? I'm going to give, oh no, this is too easy, this is too easy, this is too easy. Of course, i just going to announce him, yeah? Singing his classic melody, Catching a Wave. Everybody, put your ilima for Mr. Steve Mai. Hello, everybody. Mahalo. Um, it's an honor to be here. It's been a blessing. I just want to say a couple things about Carlos. I met him in the early 70s uh, with Pla Pahinui and Randy Lorenzo. They were recording uh, Moonlight Lady. And over the years, uh, I got to know him uh, playing music. Kaliko uh, and uh, Kai Molina went to school together. Uh, and we used to jam in Tololo. And the thing I remember about Carlos was every time I saw him, he had a new tuning. He was, he was just, uh, I was just fascinated with his Kihoalo. Uh, and I would ask him, Carlos, what is that? And he would say, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> then we played. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, was kind of part of my life was uh, I still surf in the morning in Waikiki, and Carlos would launch on this small little craft from Bowles, which is Alwana, paddle all the way to threes to pops. This is on the way coming up by the shirt and. and end up where we were surfing which was Queens and we would be oh Clifford and we would be in the water and everybody would look out the horizon and say oh that's Carlos and he would be by by Pops stand up and he would paddle all the way to and come with us and you get you know heard the stories about Speedles he had his black Speedles he was on his like six foot stand up, stand up paddle, and he had his, his leash would be wrapped around his stomach. And, and Carlos wasn't that small, you know. And then we, I would ask him, Carlos, what is that? He says, I don't know, I just made him. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of my two stories with Carlos. He was a beautiful man, very talented, uh, um, I, I admired his music and I admired his uh, his artistry, his his whole life as far as being with Hokulea and uh, Sailor and uh, it, he could do practically everything. So anyway, I'm just going to dedicate this song uh, for us and uh, uh, Andrade Ohana and everybody. Catching a wave Just feeling the freedom flowing over me You feel so free And doing a dance I'm making sweet romance When the ocean we love There's Blue skies above My heart is here to stay my soul is on its way, right high on the way, touching the sky, rushing to the shore.
catching the way, catching the way, he's feeling the freedom of me. I didn't know until I met him when he came to Kumakakuo Kalani how iconic and how connected he was to the soundtrack of my childhood. I was born in the 70s and Carlos's music, unbeknownst to me, played around in our hale, in our cars on KCCN FM 100, or oh, not FM, hello, AM 1420 on the island of Oahu. And he really was, you know, he really was somebody that impacted music that way. And then there's this group, Taj Mahal, out there, right? Internationally traveling band, known for their music around the world. And here comes Carlos Andrade, our very own from Kauai, from this little old island, to the northern end of the Pai Aina of Hawaii, getting on stage. Um, with the likes of Taj Mahal, right? And so, until he's so un unassuming, and right? he was so unassuming, he didn't make a big deal out of it. He didn't say, oh, that's my song on the radio right now. You know, he didn't care to remind us of that, but lovingly knowing that his music impacted all of us from my generation, from the, the 60s and the 70s, all the way until now. So mahalo nui. Everybody, welcome to the microphone. Of course, dear friend and musician, Pancho Graham. Aloha mai kato. Aloha mai maile, makali'i, pelika, kaimalino, me ka ohana apau. This is hard for me because I'm not much of a public speaker, and I also rely on my friend Pat Cockett to be the official voice of Nepali. But Pat's taking his long awaited break to go down to Bali right now. Anyway, I thought of a good way to get around it. And I had some felt help from uh, some of our good friends uh, and their contributions. I'm just going to read some of the lyrics from songs that Carlos wrote and that others of us wrote. Also, I'd like to begin by reading a text from Taj Mahal, our good friend who we toured with all over Europe, United States, and a really good friend of Carlos's, as you can tell when you hear this. My friend Carlos sings, My friend Carlos sings, there's rainbows over Hanlei Bay. And with co-composer and singing partner Patrick 
Kaolani sang the lovely Moonlight Lady, which has entranced me to this very day. So many beautiful, incredible, and creative songs, a voice like the absolute calm in the center of the universe, and a twinkle in his eye that would light your soul with one glance and keep it lit. Travel in and with the light, my brother Carlos. Know you are loved, missed, and that you'll forever sing inside my soul and the soul of so many others in this creation. Love, Taj Mahal. Mahalo Taj. Carlos had his ear tuned to the voices of the land. For instance, Limahuli, rushing stream, how many songs can you sing? I can sing you songs about the rain and waterfalls, silent pools, laohala trees, the bamboo standing tall. If you listen carefully, I'll fill your mind until it overflows. Moonlight lady, voice like a running stream, not too many men forget your song. Ula akapu o makana, e heamayana i kapo e o ivi, e vo umalu i kaaina. Sacred is the mountain makana calling to the native people to protect the land. So I like to think of, we'll keep listening for those voices. And he also had a great talent for documenting voyages and journeys. For the uh, voyage of Hokulea Malama Honua, he declined to go because that's, you know, that's hard work. But it's also hard work to write a really good song about it. Here's a little excerpt from that. We are all islands in a far-flung sea one mighty ocean connecting you and me. All of our destinies entwined together. Take care of our Mother Earth. And when he traveled with Taj Mahal and the Hula Blues, he wrote a great song about that too. Here's the, here's the uh, chorus. Rolling, putting kilometers away. Rolling, got another gig to play. Rolling living for the music, traveling to cities and towns. Roland, this band is really getting around, touring with Taj, doing the hula blues. When you listen to that song on Nepali, now you can just try and imagine Carlos cruising in the tour bus with his, with his uh, German style suspenders, which he adopted. He wasn't wearing lederhosen. He didn't go that far, but he definitely looked the part with the suspenders. The one uh, great influence of Carlos that he passed along to, to me was uh, the great songwriter Alfred Alohikea, also from Hanalei. I found a nice translation of his song, Hanalei Bay, from uh, um, I forget, but I'd like to read that because uh, these words also evoke Carlos's spirit. You are proud of the rain that pelts the skin. The mind goes forth to the edge of Mauna Lao. Surrounding us is a fragrance that seems to pinch the skin as a lover pinches. I sit quietly listening to the sea as it sings softly to the sand dunes. I glance up at hearing the a'o uh -oh cry, that bird that calls over the famous sand of Hanalei. Where are you, sand of poor Rosa? Sand that is much admired by visitors. You are a stranger. I am a native who has lived here a long time. All this I desire and am very fond of, all the way to the top of Nama Lakama Falls. Here is the shade of the pine trees close companions of the famous sand of Hanalei. And I also paraphrased Alfred Ilohokea in my song, and this goes out to Carlos. 
Scatter flowers in the sand. Tell the stories and the news of the land. Remember how it all began in the shade of the pine trees. And if you're looking for Carlos, Taj also has some directions. I'm going to Hanalei just to sit down on the beach. You can call me on your cell phone, but I'm gonna be out of reach. And also from Pat Cockett, speaking to the surfer. His song was called Water Speak to Me. Water speak to me, voices in the sea. There's nowhere to hide from the rising tide. Water speak to me. When I feel the wave coming over me, water set me free. When I feel the wave coming over me, water comfort me with the sweetest harmony. Take away all this pain in the falling rain. Water speak to me. I was also able to get in touch with Buffy St. Marie an old dear friend of Carlos's who's here today. And she turned me on to a couple of things that I'd never seen before. One of hers from a song called Waves. One with eyes of ocean color and ocean deep as ocean eyes can be. Look for him at sunrise. When the sunrise rainbows puddle every scarlet bay and if he's there, surfing crystal mountains, say hello for me. And she passed this on from Carlos Pardero, another witness from those days of music and surfing. His song was called The Surfer. You, your surfboard and the sea, the three of you all drenched in sun. My guitar plays as you paddle out. You're freer than a bird, my love and all my life I'll stay beside you. And these are the notes I made to talk about Carlos, but I think it's all in the music. I'd like to just finally finish with one line from Carlos. There was a Polynesian man. Mahalo.
Also, um, express the law from Nainoa and others on Hatistian uh, Oahu today. We have uh, uh, the spreading, um, not spreading, but they're putting in the sea uh, Solomon Aikau today off of the North Shore. So we've got all kind of uh, farewells going on to our friends. I also wanted to acknowledge with us today over here is a lot of the voyagers. For the last 48 uh, years of voyaging, can you guys stand? Snake, I know you can stand. We got uh, Snake Ahi from Maui, John Cruz back here, Dennis Chan, from Molokai, Kikama, Elm, and many others. You guys. Um, also, want to acknowledge those that are with us that we don't see. Yeah, Carlos being one. And uh, Pat Ayu, Dr. Pat Ayu, who we all started with back in uh, 77 on the voyaging. Because they all represent us. When we sail, they sail with us. The family has grown over the years, not only over here, not only the hundreds of people here, but the hundreds of uh, sailors that uh, throughout the Pacific. And I just want to say that it was... Um, through all these efforts of the sailing, but also through all the efforts of uh, all of uh, Ohana and everybody at home that believed that um, this was important to us, like everything else we do in Hawaii, that's Hawaiian. And so I'm just gonna uh, take you guys on a small journey, talking about Carlos's music. And as we know, well, as I think about it, you know, all this music from the past is a blueprint for the future. Yeah, all the hulas that we've learned over the, um, that the kumus have brought back, helps uh, take you to a place that you've never been to before. And it shows you uh, about it through uh, their actions and uh, everything else. I don't know how this bug is working. But I'm going to talk about this voyage. Um, it was Hokulea's fourth major voyage. It was called the Voyage of Rediscovery from 80, 1985 to 1987. This uh, song captures the first leg of the second year of the three year voyage. And uh, um, so we'll talk about the words, talk about some of the kauna. And, um, the voyage takes all us, I mean, the song takes all of us guys there. So I hope uh, we all get there. The Hokulea Hula starts off outbound for Tonga Tapu, Aotearoa goodbye. Leaving on the southwest wind, Hokulea spread your wings and fly. Ancient Polynesian pathways carry us home again. Sail on and on and on till the journey's end. Some of the kauna, just from that first one. You know, before we got down there, nobody knew that the place was called Aotearoa. We sure didn't know. And the whole idea of sailing, this is like a, an old pathway, but the idea of sailing from Aotearoa to Tongatapu hadn't been done by a va'a for we don't know how many hundreds of years. And so this was, um, just putting, uh, just part of a counter of this again. And then the idea of sailing on and on and on. It's just a continuum of taking all those old canoes and moving it forward. 
talks about on the hui, follow the stars at night, high in the southern sky. Keli i okona ikaleva, into the night while Orion dies. Southern Cross spinning slowly. In Hawaii, Southern Cross, when it gets to its highest point, and this is off the Big Island. Over here in Kauai, it's different. Off the Big Island, the, the lowest star in the Southern Cross is six degrees above the horizon. In Aotearoa, the thing never sets. When he says spinning slowly, the count of that, the thing never sets. You watch it all night. Gets to his highest point, way up high. When it touches the bottom, it swings low, never sets. Comes right back down. These are something that um, knowledge like that, for us guys, for voyaging, was lost for hundreds of years. And the only way you're going to recapture is to get those canoes back out there. And the, one of the ways to pass it on is through the melee. Sail at night for hapai, nuku alofa goodbye. Through the reefs, the shoals, the islands, fangatu lead us with your eyes. Await the wind, pangaili fuka, into vavao at night. Sail on and on and on to the morning light. That part, they left uh, Nukualofa at night because they had to get through the safe waters to get into Hapai group during the daytime. So when they say shoals and reefs and islands, not too many sailors are going to go through there. In fact, nobody in their right mind is going to sail through there really because of the currents and the hazards. The awesome story about this, they had to find a pilot to go through there. So when they asked the uh, people in Tonga, they said there's only one guy, but he's in prison. <laughs> and so the, um, when they talked to the authorities and stuff, they go, okay, we'll get him. So they went in into the prison, brought him out, and he talked to Nainoa and the rest and, and the leadership on the canoe, and they told him what, he, what they needed from him. And he says, okay. He asked them uh, about the canoe, how um, the steering, the sailing, how deep, all the right questions about trying to get through there. And then he pulled out this, this uh, chart. It looks like the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's taking it apart. It's like parchment paper, you know, real delicately. He's taking it apart. He said, this is where we're going. This is where we got to go. No lights, no buoys, no navigational aids. Come to find out, uh, Sioni Topiamuhu was like the uh, grandson of one of the last traditional navigators of those islands. This knowledge that he had was from the thousands of years, from mas master to apprentice, down to his grandfather, to his dad, and to him. And when I know it talks about this guy going through this, this place, he was just amazed by the guy's knowledge. And at first it was kind of hard because you know, uh, sometimes the Hawaiians and Samoans and Tongans and Maoris, they get together. They have their knowledge, they have their understanding, they have their trust in each other. But the other groups, I don't know. But um, so, he didn't trust Nainoa and the Hawaiians too much. And they didn't know if it was going to be safe. But after they watched this guy take this canoe through these shoals, it was amazing. This is all old knowledge. This is all part of the, uh, the learning. And um, to have him on board. So by the time they left Hapai and they went to Vavau, they came into Vavau at night. The escort boat wouldn't come in. He goes, I ain't going in there. And then I know it says, well, we're going to go in because we trust this guy. And they took him all the way through all these islands and into this deep bay. They anchored in the morning. This place is like amazing. Paradise. Matangi Tonga to Samoa, nei afu goodbye. The wind's blowing, there's no star showing. Nainoa's navigating, hold on tight. Raise the island, Tutuila, Pongo Pongo's in sight. Sail on and on and on like a bird in flight. So, Matangi Tonga, the south wind, they left 
from the afternoon to head to uh, Samoa. It's about 600 miles. When they, on the way, this big front comes rolling over that, rolling over. It's so dark that you guys kind of see each other across the table. That's how dark it is at sea. No stars, totally confused seas, but opportunity for learning and for the navigation and everybody to uh, work together. And after the uh, sun rose, everything calmed down, the wind set back in. You can see the glow of the sun in the east. You can lock right back into navigation and move on. It was an unreal thing, unreal learning uh, curve and period. The beauty about it is that, you know, all the guys that went to sail, uh, uh, Carlos included, we're all learning. Every day was learning. We never know too much, but we had to work together and we had to learn. And by, by now, on this at this point of the um, the um, the years and the decades of voyaging, just a small story to all of this. When Hokulea was built in uh, 1975, she was built for one voyage, 5,000 miles, sail down to Tahiti, come back, write about it in a book. And uh, we got something, something that we learned. But for all the uh, crew members like John Cruz and uh, Kimo Lyman and many others, and some of them, um, many of them are gone, but for most of those guys, it, it opened up a door to the possibilities of who we are as Hawaiians and our history and our ancestry and uh, our place in the oceans. So they kept it going. They kept Hokulea going, despite still not knowing too much, but willing to learn and willing to sail. The long and short of it, when you say sail on and on and on, at this point in time, Hokulea has sailed over 200,000 miles. There's seven voyaging canoes within our islands. Yeah? And there's many, many more. There are dozens more throughout the Pacific that are doing all this amazing work and connecting us all back to the source. And so, this one song that, um, one of the many songs that Carlos wrote, for us guys, it's a gift, it's a blueprint, it's a gift for us guys, it's a gift for the generations and the, um, to come to understand uh, more deeply our place and the background and where we're going and all of that. You know, as a sailor, like a surfer, as a songwriter and everything else Carlos did in his life, he was awesome. He was a pain in the ass sometimes, <laughs> but he was awesome. You know, brother worked hard, always held his watch. Yeah, he never complained, but he had stuff to say, but he never complained. <laughs> and he was awesome. And so we appreciate everything. When I talk about those 200,000 miles, I'm talking about all those efforts, all those lines, those guys in pool, all those knots that they would tie, all the times they'd open and close the sail, and every mile they would steer that bar. And I just, we're all thankful for that. So again, mahalo and aloha. Aloha tina. I will tell you the origin of that song that you just heard in a few minutes, but first I need to talk a little bit about the Speedo. <laughs> it's something about the guys born in the 40s, I think, that, that does the Speedo thing, but um, I, first, I first became aware of Carlos. It was, uh, it was an amazing day, I think it was 1972, because I was, uh, I was kind of a little bit of a troubled uh, kid growing up. So, 72, I came to live with my tutu in Hyena. And the surf was really good. And I had a, I had a brand new, had a brand new board. Do what? Stay over here. Good thing Garrett's over here for telling me what for do. Okay, stay behind the speaker. Where's the speaker? Okay. Anyway, I had a brand new board. 
And it was one of those years the West Swells just come, kept coming and coming. Every couple of days there'd be a new swell. And my brand new board had just gone on the rocks at Kaliwai because, you know, never had leash. We never even wear them around our waist, nothing. And the Speedo was because if you know more leash, you can swim better to go catch your board. Because it wasn't if, it was when you're going to be swimming. And two days after my board had gone on the rocks, Kaliwai, a swell came off on the west. And I've, never, I've only seen cannons like that three times in my life. It was a perfect west swell. Busting way outside on the cloud break and then coming through, reforming, and just peeling off. Like you see, you see this one over there? Two or three times as big as that. Had only three guys out. Carlos, Glen Kaulu Kukui, and Joey Cabell. And I just couldn't, I, did, I never like bust my board, so you know what I did? I put on my fins and I swam out. And I was out there watching these guys surf those waves from the water level. And it was just something I'll never forget. And, that, and I already knew Joey and Glenn, but I was like, who is this other guy, man? It's like, and that was my first introduction to Carlos. And being a surfer and a windsurfer and a waterman, we ended up kept showing up at the same spot or the same breaks over the years, over the, over the months, and really got to know each other through that. But today, that surfing part you heard already, so today I'm supposed to talk about Carlos in his community building years. And Carlos is a hoa aina. Hoa aina is a really special word. Hoa being friend, and of course aina, we're all familiar with, but hoa aina describes the relationship our kupuna had to the natural world. Far too often in this day and age, we think of land as a commodity to be bought and sold. Hoa aina describes a completely different relationship. A relationship of land as kin, as ohana, as family, as friend. And to me, Carlos's community building years, and especially our journey to create the Hui Makai Nano Makana and the work that we've been doing in Hyena, which this song that you just saw performed with the beautiful hula um, describes. For me, it began in the, <clears throat> in the summer of uh, 1992, that's kind of a long time ago, 1992. It was just like any other summer. <clears throat> Carlos was looking for mangoes in Surfi Pakala. And I got corralled at the post office in Hanalei and convinced by some community ladies that I should become the president of Honolulu School Parents Teacher Association because our Kamalidu were going to school there. And somehow I said yes, not to realize that within the first week of school, Hurricane Iniki would blow our school away. And Carlos that year had already begun his journey, he was well on his journey towards learning Olelo Hawaii, towards getting an academic degree. And as part of it, finishing his master's in counseling, he was serving as a counselor in Hanalei School. And so we put our heads together because the state of Hawaii basically said, your school is too small, you don't have enough students, so we're not gonna rebuild it. What you need to know is before the hurricane, they had already been neglecting our school for decades. Our cafeteria was an old World War II Quonset hut. Only thing holding it together was the termites. If they ever let go of their hands, the whole thing will fall down. <laughs> Same thing with the library. So actually, the Mahalo Keako, because the hurricane, once and for all, took care of all that. And it washed them, wiped them all out. But then the state came in and said, no, you guys are too small, so we're gonna bring in a couple trailers 
forget about hot lunch and cafeteria, we'll make it in Kilauea and we'll bust it in. And so by then, the food is several hours old. And we just said, that's not, that's not enough. We're not going to accept that. We're not going to accept that. If you're not going to build us a school, then get out of the way. You know what? We get plumbers, we get carpenters, we get architects. Carlos know how for demo on house and build on our own. <laughs> Move out of the way and we're going to take care of it. We'll build our school ourselves. And then Carlos came up with the idea, actually, several of us sitting there came up with the idea that, you know what we got to do? Because I have to tell you, you know, back up a little bit, sorry, the decade before that, we had fought some very, very difficult wars here in Honolulu, the boating wars. They tore families apart because it created economic opportunity, but it was destroying our Aina. Yeah. And, those, and those boating wars split families and created a lot of eha. And then the hurricane came along, and all of a sudden, that was gone. Because once again, we were a community. We were working to put roofs back on each other's houses and taking care of each other, malama each other. And so, Carlos saw that and we said, you know what, we gotta take this community thing straight to the decision makers. So we work with the Haraguchi family and our kids. We made Pu'olo of uh, Kalo from Hanale, and we rented on school bus and we took dirty kids, a few teachers. Where's Nick Beck? He's over here somewhere. He was the, he was the principal. And we went over there and we went to see every single senator and representative. And we end up in the Senate Ways and Means Committee at the end of the day. And we just told them, if you're not going to do it, then let us do it. We walked out of there with $6 million, but better than that was the pledge to allow us to design that school so it wouldn't be another DAG's box, but it would have a roof architecture to match the Hanalei vernacular. It wouldn't block Nomolokama. It would mimic, it would, it would reflect Nomolokama and the landscape, the historic landscape behind that. So that school that you see today started that. And it was during those years that my wife Haole, Carlos and I, Bobo Ham Young, we were really bemoaning the fact that, and, and other community leaders, bemoaning the fact that Haena had become an overcrowded playground for the tourists. The eha in our community, the, the pain in our community, because this was the breadbasket that, that fed our community. And when the Hui Kuai Aina Ohaena dissolved in 1969, the state came in and condemned that land and took it away from our Hawaiians and made it a state park. They put in one temporary parking lot, built one shed house down by the beach so the kukai could go through the sand dune into the lagoon and walked away. And the tourists came and came and came and overwhelmed our community. So some of our community leaders were, sovereignty was coming on. You know, the other night, hey, there's Brother Kaliko, and I want to mahalo them because they brought Hawaiian soul, and we showed it down in the lo'e down there, and it was really a powerful evening. And at the end of that, I told them, you know, our Koholawe was Hyena State Park. That was taken away from us and abused. You could feel and hear the Aina crying. But too many people had lost that relationship of Hoa Aina. They couldn't hear the Aina. So we said, you know what? Several in our community, we said, you know, this is sovereignty. We gotta retake the land. We gotta, we gotta repossess the land. We gotta own the land. To the point where even trees were dropped across the highway to try and block visitors from going. But actually, we said, you know what? The Aina is not something you can own. That's not how our kupuna looked at it. This isn't a commodity that, it doesn't matter who owns it. What matters is, can we reestablish our relationship to it? Can we once again care for this land and allow it to thrive because it had been completely covered with Nahelehele, with forest of alien species? So much so that you couldn't even walk through there to see the lo'i that are there today.
And those little ears have been there for over six centuries. So that shaped the idea of creating a nonprofit organization dedicated to restoring our relationship to that land. And we founded the Hui in 1999. Carlos was a founding director. In the same year, I had an extraordinary phone call from P.K. Miller. And P.K. called me up and said, Chipper, how would you like to do an indigenous mapping project? Because she was familiar with the fact that we were building this concept of using Ahupua as a modern land management tool from our work in Limahuli Garden going to the very top of the Ahupua of Hana at Hono Napali, 3,330 feet, all the way down to the highway. But our property stopped there. So P.E.K. called me up and said, how would you like, I said, sounds awesome, what's involved? I don't know, but it's got $500,000. I said, sign us up. I said, well, what are we gonna do? She goes, whatever you want. I never heard anybody, I've never, before or after, had somebody offer you half a million dollars, I say, do whatever you want. I said, we gotta be on, she goes, call this attorney in Berkeley, so I called him. He said, well, P.K. was right, you can do whatever you want because the funders have chosen four indigenous communities that are ge as geographically and culturally different as they could find in the Western United States. And they want to provide resources to these communities to reestablish their relationship to their traditional lands. What is the timing on, on, on that kind of stuff happening? The same year we founded the Hui Makai Nano Makana. They said the only catch is you gotta have three people who for the next four years will commit to being part of this and going and living in each of the, each other's communities. They call this a mapping team. And that mapping team was Carlos, my wife Haole, and myself. And through that four year experience, it was extraordinary going and living with these other indigenous communities. They had the uh, Salish Kootenai, which are a nomadic tribe up in the Montana area that range up into Southern Canada. The Santa Clara Pueblo, the Pueblo people in New Mexico. And the uh, Chupik people out on the Bering Sea, right out across from, from Russia, out there. Unbelievable, completely different and the commonalities and the ways of looking at that natural world and the ways of rebuilding relationships was what allowed us to create the path forward for the Hui Makai Nana and for our vision of Hyena State Park. And taking it from being a playground for the tourists to a resource for our community. To recreate Aina Momona. To recreate Aino Momona where the, the land could once again sustain us as we once again help to sustain the land and restore, restore the eha. You know our state motto, Uomauka ea okaina ika pono. The ea, the life of the land is when it's pono. That's what our mission has always been, to reestablish that and to use it to perpetuate and teach the practices of our kupuna. So back to that four year grant, we had to have a final product. You know, like every grant, you gotta have a final report. So Carlos had the idea. We're gonna make a song because how did our ancestors map the natural world? True Oli, true Mele. Those were their mechanisms for perpetuating, for, through Mo'olelo, for perpetuating this knowledge. You heard that from Bruce just a few minutes ago in the Kauna of the Hokulea song, right? So that's how we wrote that song. And it's so beautiful. Every time I hear that song, I think about Carlos's vision of reestablishing our modern day. You know, we get cell phones, we get all this stuff. It just takes us away from, from our relationship to the Aina. But that was our vision, that was his vision. We need to recreate that whole Aina relationship. Because when we have that relationship, you cannot walk away. You feel that kuleana. 
It's no longer a choice. You have no choice. You're obligated to Malama Aina, to Aloha Aina. And those were formative years for Carlos in, in creating that Malama Aina curriculum that Mihana was talking about. All those experiences are coming together and then he became one high mock mock professor over there and you're gonna hear about that from John coming up, you know? But, I mean, I admire this guy because I don't know if it was on midlife crisis or what, but you know, in the middle of his life, he decided, I'm going back to school. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go. That is not easy kind of stuff to do. Actually, it wasn't a midlife crisis at all. It was a deepening and deepening desire to learn more about Ola Hawaii and his culture. And he thought that this was a mechanism to do that. And it's so amazing because in that journey he went on to learn, he then perpetuated and taught it and passed that on to this next generation of Hawaiians growing up today. You know, my wife is a, one of the very first graduates of the Center for Hawaiian Studies before a center even existed. It was only an academic idea. Never had kamakoku o kalani, never had nothing. And now to see what has become today. It's unbelievable. So this lei that you see here, or Ohana made it, it's intertwined with my lei Lauli Ili from Koke and from Limuhuli, representing Carlos's love for the whole Pai Aina, but especially every part of this Mokopune of this island. And as we as we were, especially yesterday, as I was picking this Miley in Limuhuli, the young Miley was growing up like this against the old Miley, the woody one, the one you know can pick. And I could hear Carlos, I could see Carlos, he's that old one, allowing the young ones to climb up on top of him so they can grow. So we made this lay and I'm gonna go put it over there on the recycled wood because that was awesome. I'm pretty sure some of that came from the old club band, yeah, the Honolulu Plantation. But who knows, because he gets so many old woods inside his house, you know. But Kaimalina, what a beautiful job you did in making that. So this is that play for Carlos from our Ohana. Yeah. Mahalo. And if you listen carefully, I'll fill your ears till they overflow.
can you see? I can see the wind blowing out across the waves. Misty clouds let warm blossoms, ancient hidden caves. And if Our next speaker that's coming up is Dr. John Osorio, and he represents a time in Carlos's life that we like to affectionately call the suspender period in Carlos's life. For many of us students who were at Kamakakuo Kalani in the early 2000s, we would see this large Portuguese Hawaiian man coming up the stairs with suspenders and as my Auntie Maida likes to re uh, remind us, and a belt. <laughs> and she used to tell him, Carlos, you know you only have to wear one of those. You don't have to wear two. So the next day he comes with palaka shorts. Mind you, palaka shorts have, they have like a rope at the top over here, right? He go clip his suspenders on the rope of his palaka shorts, and that became the look. That became the look of the early 2000s. Kamakako Kalani, if you was anywhere around Manoa, you'd see this large Portuguese man walking around campus with his palaka shorts, his suspenders. Yeah. And then after that is when we got introduced to the whole Speedo Carlos that came later in our memory. But yeah. So talk to talk about more of that time period of Carlos. Oh, also. What Chipper had talked about, about his work in Haena. You guys all know that Carlos is a published author, right? How many of you have his book, his book on Haena? My kai, my kai. Those of you who either didn't know that he was a published author or who do not have his book, you can go to any bookstores. I don't know how much of them exist, except for Anoa who have native books. A Maui, you guys have native intelligence, and then Amazon, I guess, for the rest of the world. Get Carlos's book on Haena. Yeah, it is not only a piece of scholarship that many of us academics have referred to over the years. It is also a beautiful testament, its own song, to this part of the island of Haena. Yeah, John? Okay, okay. Oh, hey, uh, Kawa, Aloha nui, aloha nui, 
in a Hoaina, in a Kupukupa Aina, in a Hauma, a Ohana, in Vili Ia, Eke Aloha, Loke Iaina. Ovao o Jonathan K. Kamakavivo Ole Ozorio, and I wanted to introduce myself in Hawaiian, even though I am not fluent in the language as Carlos wanted us to be. But he would have been disappointed not to hear this language um, from me today. It, it took a long time before I realized that Carlos Andrade was the uh, composer of Hula Maiden and um, Moonlight Lady. And, and one of the reasons for that is that he never talked about his musical career. Unlike many of us who played music on Oahu, I'm pretty convinced that most of Carlos's performance were on this island and for his friends. In that way, he reminded me a lot of uh, Nico Martin, another person very combined to this island. Liko was somebody who wrote many songs and they were recorded by other people, Carlos also. And part of the thing that I always knew about Carlos is that he was not someone who was sort of planning his career as he went through his life. I was talking to Miley earlier and she said, she's, I, she didn't even know how many times he had changed his his major as he went through the university system. When I first got to know Carlos is when he came to work at the Center for Hawaiian Studies. I'd only been there a couple of years myself when he started as an academic advisor, as a counselor for our students. He left shortly after he started and went back and finished his PhD in geography and then eventually was hired back as a professor, as an assistant professor in Hawaiian studies at Kamakaku Okalani. He was always the same person. He never changed in that sense. Academic advisor, professor, eventually associate professor, eventually director of the Center for Hawaiian Studies. He was always the same person. Incredibly intimidating to people. To me, um, and you know, I was, I'm younger than Carlos, but I was always a little bit afraid of him because, not because he was gruff. I'd known gruff people in my life. I was intimidated by the fact that he knew so very much about everything. He was a voyager. As you've heard, all of these stories, Voyager, singer, composer, surfer. I saw films of him surfing in the 1960s that became part of a motion picture that made surfing popular in the world. He was on the Hokulea. And then as we got to know each other more, I realized that Actually, the deepest part of his knowledge was not just those things that he did that took him to other parts of the world. It's what he did here, on this island. And the times that we visited here, I got the chance to spend time with Carlos and came to understand how so very much, how so deeply he loved this place and the people who lived here. Carlos was hired as a um, part of what we call a joint hire <clears throat> called Hui Konohiki. Um, Lili Kalakamelehiva was one of the people who had envisioned this and had put this group of people together. It was Carlos and several other young professors who were hired in geography and in oceanography. And their job was to create um, a catalyst for teaching how we be responsible for the land, how to come back to the land, how to understand 
how to understand the communities that live on the land that are absolutely integrated with these places. Geography was teaching people about communities and land, but it was Carlos who taught geographers that these things are never separate, that they were always integrated together, grasping tightly to one another, and that the real tragedies of the 19th and 20th centuries in Hawaii were not just the hundreds of thousands of people who passed away in those waves of epidemics, it was the pulling of our people off of the land, off the land of their ancestors, off of the land of their families. That separation from Aina. And that's what he writes about in Aina, through the eyes of our ancestors. The work is brilliant, not just because it offers this clarity about our connection to the Aina. This work is brilliant because it comes from someone who knew this firsthand. And if there was something that really defined academics before Carlos, it was half the time we were talking about something that we had no personal connection to. Carlos and writers like Carlos insisted that this is not possible this is not relevant. This makes no sense. And he knew this so thoroughly that when you were in his presence, you could have theories. You could have ideas about what Hawaii was or where we were going. But Carlos would look at you and smile because he knew what it was to like to actually live on the land. And the stories that he shared, all of these that you have heard, they are all true stories. Carlos lived as, as a kupa aina. Carlos lived as a surfer. Carlos lived as a traveling musician. Carlos lived as a voyager. And Carlos lived as a teacher and a writer. How could you possibly cram more things into a life? So I want to celebrate Carlos. I realize I didn't give you a whole lot of details about his academic career, but that's because I don't remember very many of them. We were all just crazy going after this Ike, this knowledge. Two things. I, I'm not sure that Carlos is the first person to say this, but I heard it from him first. He asked me one time, he says, you know what the difference is between Mokupuni and Aina? And I, you know, I, I was trying to think my, through my, my, my lessons in Hawaiian and what I understood. He, says, he just stopped me because um, Carlos already had the answer. He says, no, Aina is when you name it. It's when you name the land. It was the first time I ever heard that. The other thing he told me was, John, you really ought to work in the Aina yourself. And one of these days, Carlos, I'm going to take you up on it. <laughs> I, I just want to say aloha to him and to and give my aloha to the family, to Maile and Kamali'i and Talika and Kaimalino and, and all the grandchildren, um, the brothers, Pierre. You don't know me, but I, I used to look at your picture in the annual when I was a seventh grader. You were my my brother's class. Um, let's see. I just want to send this out to you. It's a song that Randy Borden and I wrote for George Hellman, Kimo Mitchell. And it seems really appropriate today. I can recall
before you left to seek your destiny. That older voice is gone and drowned your laughter. But I believe you knew what you would have. that I always shared with my students is that the right path may not be the path that makes sense to most people. Carlos, of course, got his bachelor's, I believe, in, in Hawaiian studies at UH Hilo, and they got his master's in counseling and guidance, and they got his PhD in geography. Now, in the Hawaiian mind, that all works together. Other academic advisors would have probably been like, what are you doing with yourself? But it created it created the man that has impacted so much of us. And we have benefited and will continue to benefit from that legacy. Uncle Brian, please give us our pule. A pule kako. On one of his um, musical journeys with Taj Mahal to Europe, he told me a story that happened to him and a younger guy, a younger guy that was, on, was part of the band. Taj had picked up a young guy as part of the band and they were playing in um, one of the countries in Europe and after a gig, it was about 10, 10, 30, I think Carlos said, that the young guy came up to him and said, hey, uncle, time to go out, man, let's go out, party. And, uncle, and Carlos told the young guy, you go. I gotta go get my beauty, my beauty rest. <laughs> and the, guy, the, young, the young kid told Uncle Carlos, brother, it's way past your bedtime. <laughs> That was so neat. <laughs> but anyway, it's it's way past the program that Pelika had outlined um, for this uh, for this morning. It should have been morning, but she did want to say thank you everyone for staying, for coming, and for staying. And on behalf of Miley, her children, her grandchildren, brothers, uh, Carlos's brothers and sister, they truly want to thank you. All of you, not only for coming and staying, but for those of you that have contributed to the resources of putting on this day with the tents, pounding the pegs, pulling the rope, for the cooks in the back there, getting the food ready, and for those of you that contributed all to that, this could be a very memorable day, and a spectacular day to remember a wonderful friend, brother, father, dad, Grandpa, everything. Thank you so very much. And as Carlos would say, he ended your conversations, Pierre, with Aloha, Pierre. He ended our conversations as we got to talk uh, towards the sunset of his life. He would end our conversations with Mahalo Kiaku. And so that's how we end our program uh, this afternoon. And after we after we pull in. I think Sister will tell us how you can get all what you're waiting for. <laughs> okay, now, just for a moment, shall we pull a kako?
our eternal Father in heaven, the one who gives life to each one of us, if every now and then, dear Lord, you have someone in your in mind that you want to gift with skills, with talents, with knowledge, the desire for knowledge, and with aloha to be amongst your children. And you had that in one of your sons that we have heard about this afternoon. You have blessed this son of yours, dear Lord, our friend, our brother, our whatever he is to us. You have blessed him so very much. With all that was shared this afternoon the skills to sail, the knowledge to record and, and remember, to preserve in Mele. Thank you. That's all we can say. Mahalo kiakuli, Lord, for blessing this man so much and giving us, each one of us here, whatever that standing may be, to give each one of us here the privilege of knowing this man and the legacy that he leaves behind. And now, dear Lord, the, the sun has set on the chapter of this man's journey, Brother Carlos. But yet the journey will go on through his children, his grandchildren, his wife, his brothers and sister, and each one of us that had a part of the, to be on this journey with him. What a privilege it has been, dear Lord. What a ride it has been. And we have all you to thank for. So thank you for blessing us with this man. Thank you for blessing him with the gifts that you gave him because you knew that in such a person, you had the right person that would share it with his family, and with his community. He didn't keep it for himself. He didn't try to make tons of money. Because that, that's not what he valued. And you say in your word that even before you, he was born, you knew who he was. And he was the perfect one that you chose for our era in this time in our earth's history. So we thank you once again, Kiyokua, for blessing this man and having him touch every one of our lives. Thank you for the love that has been shown to his family. But especially, dear Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who has made it possible, given us the hope that this is not the end of Carlos's journey. Because this whole world is moving towards your soon return. And when it does, we will be able to see our dear brother and friend and husband and grandpa and uncle and, you know, able to see each other again. And not only him, but all those that have gone to rest they await that day to greet and meet their families again. And together we will be in a place that you have prepared for us. For you have said and you have promised that I go and prepare a place for you. And when I, where I go, I promise to come back and get you so you can be where I am. And where he is today, there is no more separation. There is no more sickness, there is no more death, there is no more crying. Amen. Mahalo, mahalo, Uncle Ryan.